A tool worth having in your physics and engineering bag of tricks is the ability to visualize the Fourier transforms of certain functions. There are a lot of functions, and I'm going to summarize a few of them here. There's the Fourier transform of the sine or the cosine, a decaying sinusoid, a sinusoidally modulated sinusoid, a finite cosine, a boxcar function, or rather a top hat filter, a Dirac delta function, a triangle wave, and the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. So I'm going to go over what the transform of each one of these functions is and a little bit of justification for why and how you can mentally see those Fourier transforms without doing the math. The simplest Fourier transform is of a sine or a cosine wave, infinitely long. Make the same argument for sine of kx or cosine of kx. Likewise, you can make this argument for sine of omega t or cosine of omega t. So a sine wave has only one frequency, and since the Fourier transform is converting from one domain into the other, from spatial domain into wave number domain, k and x, or from time domain into frequency domain, omega and t, there's only one k that corresponds to this because there's only one wavelength that corresponds to this wave. So if I made a Fourier transform of this infinite sine wave, it would look like a single spike. In k space, there is only one value, so it will occur at that place. And at that particular k value, we'll call it k1. That's the wave number that corresponds to this sine wave or cosine wave. That's the Fourier transform. Cosine of kx and minus cosine of kx are equal. So given that I've sketched a cosine wave, Let's have an origin and go to the exact same place on the opposite side of the origin. And that's a valid solution as well. So you can write them as Dirac delta functions. You can do it mathematically, quickly actually. The Fourier transform of a cosine is the integral of the cosine times e to the i k x dx from minus infinity to plus infinity. But instead of writing cosine, I'm going to write the exponential version. The integral of e to the i k x from minus infinity to plus infinity is the Dirac delta function. And that's exactly what is sketched up above. So the thing to remember is that the Fourier transform of a sinusoid is a double Dirac delta function. The one thing that's different if it's a sine instead of a cosine is that because sine of minus k x is minus sine of x, the Dirac delta function on the negative side points downward for sine. A little modification to the sine wave is a sine wave that decays. How is this different from a pure sinusoid? Well, besides the fact that we gave it a starting point at x equals 0, the decay adds components to that cosine. And it shows up in the Fourier transform as a broadening of those delta functions. How broad it gets depends on how quickly it decays. So if I describe the sinusoid as e to the minus alpha x times a sine wave, if alpha is very small, you essentially have the sine wave. But if alpha is very large, this becomes even more broadened. And squat. A good example of this would be a monochromatic electromagnetic wave propagating through a lossy dielectric media. So a decaying sinusoid is a broadened Dirac delta function. What if I modulate a sinusoid with another sinusoid? Function f of kx is a high frequency sinusoid and in function g of x is a low frequency sinusoid, which is furthermore offset from the horizontal axis. If I multiply these two functions together, I have a modulated sine wave, I'll call it h of x, which is the product. The corresponding Fourier transforms of each of these are what we were discussing with the first example of a sinusoidal wave. So the transform of function f is the double Dirac delta function. The transform of function g of x is similar 
a double Dirac delta function, but with the wavelength being very long, k is very short, and so the doublet is here. Because this cosine is offset from the x-axis by an amount, there's an additional term at the origin. That's the offset. The higher this g of x is from the x-axis, the larger this arrow at k equals 0 will be. And so finally, the transform of this modulated sine wave will be similar. You'll have a double Dirac. But this double Dirac will have side bands due to the modulation. And each one of these triplets will look just like the Fourier transform of g of x. This is, in fact, something called the frequency convolution theorem which says that the Fourier transform of the product of two functions is the transform of the first function convolved or convoluted with the Fourier transform of the second function divided by 2 pi. And that's in fact what's happening here. You have the first function's Fourier transform and the second function's Fourier transform. Convoluting these two transforms is a matter of taking one of them and superimposing it onto the other one. And that's the convolution of the two. So the transform of sinusoidally modulated sinusoid is a double Dirac delta function with sidebands. Our first transform was a sinusoid, and then a decaying sinusoid, and then a modulated sinusoid. Now let's do a finite sinusoid. If I have a cosine that starts and stops at a specific place, and I'll center it at the origin. X sub f is the start and stop location. There's a specific wavelength with wave number k1. An infinite cosine transformed into a pair of Dirac delta functions. For finite cosine, these delta functions will be spread out. Where just like the infinite cosine, the delta functions were centered at plus and minus k for the wave number for the cosine, the same is here. They will be centered at plus or minus k, just spread out. With a spreading that depends on the finiteness of the cosine, still centered at plus or minus k1, they will cross zero and come back and die out. The distance between these peaks depends on the length of the cosine train. It's the wave number of the overall cosine train. If the cosine were in fact dc, that is if it had infinite wavelength and k would be zero, these two peaks would converge at the origin. Let's find out what these peaks are analytically. The transform of a finite cosine is the integral over that range of cosine, which I'll write in exponential form. And you can solve this integral as just exponentials. If you look at these, it looks like sine of wave number times the position over the wave number. I want to put it in the form of a standard special function by recognizing that this is k1 plus k downstairs and in the argument. And if I can put an x sub f right there, which works if I put it out here, I recognize the ratio sine of x over x is sinc. And that's in fact what I sketched up here for the Fourier transform. This is what a sinc function looks like. It is peaked at the place where the argument equals zero. And then it oscillates with side bands with the wavelength that is this x final. A physical example of this situation is a laser pulse. We have laser light for just a very brief instant of time. It leads to a lot of spreading in wavelength domain. Hence, you don't have monochromatic pulses because of all the wavelengths that end up inside the pulse. If a finite cosine pulse gives you a pair of sync functions, where the location of each sink depends on the wavelength of oscillation of the cosine, and the separation between the peaks in the sink depends on the overall length of the wave train, then you can surmise what would happen if you took away the oscillation and just had a boxcar filter. In that case, what changes is the location of the sink. So those two sink functions in the pair of sinks come together at the origin in k-space to give one single sink.
I think it's worth making a point about where the sink hits zero. And since the sink is sine of x over x, the values of k for those zeros are multiples of pi over the width of the sink function. This is the way the diffraction pattern of an aperture in optics is described. One of the simplest but most important Fourier transforms is that of the Dirac delta function, which is a function that has a value at only one place. And there are various functions that model this spike behavior, but all these functions have the commonality that at one particular value of x, they have value, otherwise they have no value. There's only one particular value of x, and so if you have an f of kx, it only has a value at one particular x, but it has value at all values of kx, it must have the same value at all k. And in fact, that value is 1. It's a complex number, so this axis has to be labeled as the modulus of f of kx rather than f of kx. This particular case has a one-line proof to it. The Fourier transform of that delta function, the integral from minus infinity to infinity of a delta function, that's the function that has a value of infinity when the argument is zero and otherwise has value of zero. Using the sifting property of the delta function, this is e di kx evaluated at x equals x zero. So the Fourier transform of a delta function is unity with the phase. That is, the magnitude of e to the i k x zero is one, but e to the i k x zero has phase. This is the uncertainty principle. If x, which is position, is well defined, which it is with the delta function, then k, which is momentum, is completely unknown. The Fourier transform of the direct delta function is a special case of the more general case of the Fourier transform of the triangle wave. The triangle function has an amplitude of a, and it hits the x-axis at plus or minus x0, meaning it has a slope of a over x0. Take the Fourier transform of that function. The function is slope times x plus the y-intercept. Stare at this for a minute and make sure that you see that this is the equation for the line in the negative side. Put an integral sign there. And convince yourself that a over x0 times x0 minus x is the equation of the line on the positive side. This is the Fourier transform of that function. You can work out the integrals yourself. There's a lot of integration by parts involved, but what you end up with which is the area of that triangle times the sink squared function. A useful thing to know about delta functions is that the area under a delta function is unity. It has an amplitude of infinity and its width is going to zero, but the area under the curve is always one, so that this ax zero, which is the amplitude of that sink squared, is one. The triangle wave Fourier transforms into K space as a sink squared. If you take the limit as a goes to infinity and x0 goes to 0, that's a delta function. And if you take the limit as a goes to infinity and x goes to 0 of this Fourier transform function, sink squared goes to 1 because sink of 0 is 1. And with the area under that curve being 1, because the area under a delta function is 1, this begins to broaden until finally you have unity across all of k. So the limit of the Fourier transform of the triangle wave as x goes to zero and a goes to infinity is the Fourier transform of a delta function. I think one of the most important Fourier transforms is that of the Gaussian. In quantum mechanics, this is your free particle propagator. The function looks like a bell curve. We'll consider a simple Gaussian located at the origin. Constant a is associated with the width of, of the Gaussian. The coefficient out front, square root of a over pi, comes from the normalization of the function for quantum mechanical purposes. We take the Fourier transform. And this is a tricky integral to solve. Let me put it in a slightly different form. 
This integral can be solved by completing the squares in that exponential. There are several YouTube videos that demonstrate doing that, and I might make my own if I get requests to do so. When you do solve the integral, you find very simply that the Fourier transform of this function, e to the minus ax squared, with that in front, is e to the minus k squared over 4a. Recognize that in k space, that's a Gaussian. This is a bell-shaped curve. So the Fourier transform of a Gaussian is a Gaussian. Other surprises lurk inside this result. If you take the limit of this constant a, 1 over a corresponds to the width of this function, let a go to infinity, the function becomes a spike located at the origin. With a going to infinity, this function e of x is a delta function. It's a spike at the origin, it's delta of 0. Inspect the Fourier transform in the same limit. The transform goes to e to the 0. It goes to unity. Makes sense because the Fourier transform of delta function is unity, and if it's a delta function at the origin, it's unity with no phase. So we recover this exactly. So there we have eight functions. It's a library that you can use as a starting point for your own library. And all of the Fourier transforms that we worked on here can be deduced logically from each other. If you know one, you can surmise others. The Fourier transform of sinusoid is a pair of Dirac delta functions centered about the origin. If you allow that sinusoid to decay, you broaden those delta functions. And if you modulate the sinusoid, you pick up sidebands on those delta functions. And then if you concatenate the sinusoid, just make it short, you get not a pair of delta functions, but they turn into sinc functions. And if you take away the oscillations within that region, you have the boxcar filter, and your sinc pair turns into a single sinc located at the origin. If you take the Fourier transform of a delta function, you get unity, and if that delta function is not at x equals 0, that Fourier transform will have phase to it. If you take the transform of a triangle, you'll get a sinc squared. But if you take the limit as the triangle becomes infinitesimally narrow, you recover the delta function. And if you take the Fourier transform of a Gaussian, you get a Gaussian. And if you take the limit that that Gaussian becomes infinitesimally narrow, you recover the Fourier transform of a delta function too. So that's your beginning point. You have a library. So go forth and build a further library that includes functions that you encounter in your own field of study, whether it's quantum mechanics or optics or signals or anything else.